true despair, music, I think, actively revolts against that. And I think that's part of its power. It's not that it's not there, but it's always tethered, I think, to something that's lifting it out in the very act of transmuting those feelings into, into musical form. Hello everybody from a lockdown London and welcome to COVID Classical, the playlist for our troubled times. My name is Dane Lam and I am principal conductor of the Xi'an Symphony Orchestra in China. I conduct orchestras and at opera houses all over the world when this is not happening. But now that we're in lockdown each week, I will curate a playlist comprised of some of the most sublime and affecting classical music ever written. And each playlist will deal with an emotion that we're likely to experience in lockdown. Last week, we had the emotion of humor. It's a bit of a, a vault fast this week, and we deal with despair. Now despair seems at first a really easy emotion to define. If we, we take the Latin, de sperare, literally means de, without, sperare, hope. It's the absence of hope. It's bleak, it's difficult to grapple with, but I think we have all felt some level of despair through this. You know, we've lost work, some people have lost loved ones, we've lost agency, we've lost a life that we were living before and there's been an element of grieving and there's been undoubtedly some sort of element of despair but the question is is it possible to have the emotion of despair alongside the act of human creation the act of the creation of art of music because is that creative act a step of defiance against this absence of hope, a step towards hope, as it were. It's something I discuss with my guest this week, Yaron Liefschitz. He is a friend with whom I worked on an opera, Gluck's Orpheus and Eurydice, last year in Brisbane, Queensland. Um, and it was a collaboration between Opera Queensland and Yaron's company, of which he is artistic director, Circa one of the world's leading contemporary circus companies. Now, Yaron thinks very deeply and profoundly about a whole range of human emotions, and he's a fantastic director. And we really got to the nub of what despair might or might not mean in music. And it, it, it's a contentious issue, because so much of this despairing music from these despairing situations in operas, for example, where a character is dying or where a character has experienced some kind of other loss of, of, of love, of life, of freedom, of agency. It's always juxtaposed with great beauty, at least almost always juxtaposed with this beauty. And we see it too in absolute music. And by absolute music, I mean music that has no words nothing extra musical associated with it. So Yaron and I go deep into that and, and, and try and drill deep into what constitutes despairing music and how music and how art can offer us a way forward, a way forward through to hope to come out the other side. And thanks for, thanks for agreeing to come on this, this little podcast, this vlog. No, I'm very excited. So we've just been dealing with a different emotion each week. So the first week was hope, and then it was humour, and then I thought, well, it's about time to plumb the depths of despair. Well, that's my that's my happy place. So you've you picked you picked well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's I think it's something that we're all experiencing at the moment. Have Have you had any sort of feelings of despair? I bet you have through all this. Um, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think despair is one of those, that kind of absence of hope and, and really the sense that there's a kind of emotion without a, without a really clear object. I mean, in your career, because you, you trained as a, as a straight theatre director, right? That's right, yeah. I, I and trained then... and, and didn't do very well at it, but I, I was <laughs> technically 
technically I've got my license to drive a theater production. Because then you found yourself going into, well, circus above all, and, but also things like opera. So I suppose genres and disciplines that were outside your immediate milieu, did you ever feel that despair when you were first getting into these, these new art forms before putting your stamp on them? Uh, not despair. I, for me, that's terror. For me, that's terror. Mm -hmm. Um, I, but I only like working in things that I'm bad at. Um, so I, I'm, I'm good at words. Like I've got a master's degree in creative writing, but I don't like directing plays that have words because I just get too interested in the words and forget the, 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 the drama and the action and the theatricality because the words are, are enough in many ways for me. I work in circus, but I have no physical skill. And I work in opera and, and various forms of kind of theatricalized music, even though I have no musical ability. And so my being a, you know, an imposter creates this space of terror. And I quite like that terror. It's, it's it struck me that your, your, your process in that, in the rehearsal room, especially with working with, you know, the acrobats in the room, is a very collaborative one and there's a lot of improvisation going on. I mean, can you speak to that way of working a little bit, which was so new and so stimulating and exciting for me to watch, having never worked with acrobats before? Yeah, look, I think it's very particular circa acrobats. And, and it's, so the thing about circus is very much like great jazz, is that it's, it's put together, it's really the art form of the moment. It's put together in this kind of, exquisite coming together of skill and listening and, and structure and form and then kind of just presence in that moment. And so for me, I, I started working in very traditional theatrical ways that didn't work very well. Uh, and my kind of curiosity led me to find ways that would, would mesh what the artists were doing um, with with their kind of choice making would turn them into the authors of their own work that they were in, um, and I think risk became a very important part of that. So I never feel like uh, we're free to fail, but I feel like what you can gain on stage is only a function of what you're prepared to risk. So if all you're prepared to do is is be correct, then that's all you'll ever be in terms of the product you put. If you're prepared yeah, to go absolutely. into into love and and vulnerability and fragility and 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 overreach and wrestle with big ideas and and, and emotions, then you may achieve those and you may fail horribly. I mean, being being an artist is to sort of you know walk in the footsteps. We all walk in the footsteps of Icarus. I mean, we, we're going to fly too close to the sun, and we're going to at some point our wings are going to melt. And we all know that. That's part of the contract. And I think it's part of the adrenal uh, rush that keeps us doing what we do. Um, and more, audiences pick up on that as well, don't they? Uh, absolutely. Uh, which is why I think. I mean, in, in thinking about despair in music. My conclusion, and I'm sorry if this kind of messes with your with your um, emotional palate, but my conclusion was that despair is actually impossible in music. You can you can glimpse it occasionally through the moving, kind of through the the fog, but actually, as soon as you're writing a piece of music, you, there is something inherently hopeful in the act of putting a, a, a blot of ink onto a stave. And that music keeps tr transforming uh, at its saddest point into moments of exquisite beauty. I mean, most of my favourite pieces are really sad. Like I say, despair is my happy place. Yeah, I, I suppose that that begs the question. Then, can despair and beauty coexist? Well, I think I think if despair is the absence of hope, then I think loss, dejection, uh, angst, um, you know anguish all absolutely exist but i think before you get to utter despair there is always uh i think in in particularly in music much more so than in things like like poetry or, or um 
uh, theater. I mean, I, I think you can, you can express kind of absence of hope in theater. I feel that many times in sitting in a theater, like, like you know, there is no hope in this play mm. and often that uh, in a comedy, but that's, you know, even in very well done work, I think you can, there's kind of the space for it not to be magnificent, but I can find lots of work of terror and, and anguish, but true despair music I think actively revolts against that and I think that's part of its power it's not that it's not there but it's always tethered I think to something that's lifting it out in the very act of transmuting those feelings into into musical form and are you able to articulate what it is about music as opposed to the other arts that has this inherent hope, what is it about these, these disembodied sounds, these wordless sounds a lot of the time, that, that creates the conditions for underlying hope against all these odds? It's a really great question. And I don't, I mean, for me, music is a mystery. Um, I love the, there's a line in one of Borges's po poems where he says, describes music as that mysterious form of time. Um, and I love that line because it makes me think that at its core music is this kind of it's human existence in a different time signature like it's kind of we've heard all the sounds there's nothing new that we're actually hearing it's just how they put together in what order and in what time that kind of makes this kind of somehow changes the fabric of the emotional universe that you're in and i don't know why that is from a like you know physiological spiritual psychological perspective but i know that it happens and that you know i used to have a, a pair of neighbors that used to fight terribly and i put my speakers in the window and play them the adagio from rachmaninoff's second piano concerto on full bore, mm. just in the kind of hope that it would sort of melt their their kind of screaming at each other and i don't know if i don't know for work but i'm sure that there's somewhere in their deep psyche hopefully they're they're healthy and not together um but somewhere in their deep psyche there's this kind of stain of that music that kind of just makes them feel reminds you about why why you fell in love in the first place maybe there's something in the abstraction of music of at least of, of at least instrumental music that gets in on a level below the subconscious below below the the intellect oh absolutely absolutely i mean my my most powerful ever musical memory was sitting in the New York Philharmonic listening to Verdi's Requiem and discovering while daydreaming, I was leaving the next day and I was dreaming of the flight that I'd be on. And I suddenly thought that the roof was leaking and I realized that I was in tears and my conscious brain had had no time to kick into the experience that my heart was really happening experiencing. I think that that's absolutely true. And I think it's the reason why music is so powerful and that I'm much more interested in the abstract than in the concrete. Like I don't like, I'm not a great fan of programmatic music or things that I feel like are describing something in the outside world. Same as in my stage work, I, I do story. I find opera much more complex to direct than I do uh, a beta setting of Beethoven's Ninth where pure structure and abstract form sits much more easily on me. The one characteristic of Beethoven's music that's absolutely overriding for me is that there really is never any sort of despair without hope in his music. There's, there's something that's so inherently optimistic about Beethoven absolutely absolutely and and i mean working on that piece uh you know they let the carnies into the concert hall and it was tremendously successful uh you know every three performances that people leapt to their feet had literally leapt to their feet roared at the end of and i think the the experience that i had was that the music is so hopeful and you know in beethoven nine you've got this kind there's a mixture of it's bombastic at points. It's kind of potentially overblown. It's kind of, you know, it, it's, it's unapologetically so dense and kind of motifically. It's rich. a constant struggle. Beethoven's a constant struggle, isn't it? Which is yeah. so hopeful. 
Yeah, that's right. And I think that that's the, I think that the absent, like it, it's not about absence of, of hope. It's about testing and, and, and um, metabolizing it, metabolizing loss into, into hope and those kind of those sparse opening kind of, I don't know what they are kind of sounds really. I mean, there's sort of barely music at the very start of the symphony. And we had someone crawl, kind of crawling on in a contorted way across a very long stage. It's kind of 16 meter long kind of plinth and going, really, that's, that's what you are. You're, you're learning you're, to walk. You're moving against the, the wind. You're trying to stand up as a human and what happens. And I think that, you know, that texture for me is de deeply hopeful and Beethoven, you know, I mean, when you go to 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 work and Beethoven is writing the score, you're probably going to be led by some, you know, led well, and he's going to put demands on you. It was a, it was a real kind of um, uh, I found it a cognitive marathon. Like I found like keeping all the bits in mind. Well, almost anything worked, but how you put anything in any given place was the really complex part. That's the thing that, that we struggle with sometimes is this, is there beauty in sadness? Is there beauty in despair? Is there beauty in death, in mortality? Yeah, absolutely. And I think music is, I mean, music is the absolute, um, the greatest conveyor of that. I mean, if you think about how many requiems have been written and, you know, in the way in which how many death arias, how many um, how many threnodies, like the um, uh, you know the, this kind of the way music can take sadness and transmute it into beauty and longing, um, but also terror and anger and and fear and and all the you know the palette of emotions that kind of hover around despair, I think is, is incredibly powerful. And I think that's its, that's its magic. I don't think it wants to rest. If we think about it like a, um, a sort of parabola going down to the bottom, if despair is the very bottom, is the kind of still point, music, the very fact of you playing music means you can't quite reach it. Maybe there's a moment of stillness or silence or kind of you dip your toe in it, but very quickly, as soon as you kind of continue to you know, wave your conductor's baton or, 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 you know, bow the cello, you're going to land up the very act of that adds a seed of hope. And I think that, but it, the hope only means something if you're aware of that kind of impossible point at the very bottom of the curve. And I think what music does is it reminds us that we are not the character who's experiencing that in our moment of life in exactly the same way that Orpheus do, does at the start, that the, the, the medium we live in is life. And that's the kind of the, the, the sea, the puddle that we swim in, that's where we are. But at the moment we may feel incredibly despairing. Yeah. I think that's a fantastic way to look at it. I think that's right. And it's, a way of hovering over this lake of despair and being able to lift off again. So that's right. So it's, this is the playlist where we can sort of hover over the lake of despair a little bit. Yeah. Could you find one piece that epitomizes despair for you? Oh yeah. Well, I, I thought very hard about it and I listened to a great many pieces of music in the last few days. I, for me, the piece that spoke most directly to me of the closest thing to despair was the 14th symphony of Shostakovich, ah. which is, um, and particularly the 10th movement, which is the one that's set to a real Capone. And it's, a, it's got these, um, these strings at the beginning that are as close. I mean, I listen, I start that are as close to kind of, nothing no no light through breaking through those clouds as i can imagine and i i, start, I started by listening to opus 147 his his last this the viola sonata and went back through the eighth and the 15th and the quartets that i know very well i know the symphonies less well 
but the 14th, yeah, the, the 10th movement of the 14th symphony, I think is probably about as close to a piece of genuine despair as I can find. I, the funny thing, the other thing that I should say is that having gone through as much listening to dis, almost despairing music, I feel happier. I think that's the rub. That's how it works, isn't it? It's cathartic, but it helps. Music can help us feel deep emotions in a world that doesn't encourage the feeling of deep emotion, really. Things are in sound bites. Pop songs last for four minutes. And then That's all right. of a sudden, we have to feel, actually feel. And I think people are much more open to be feeling at the moment. That, but, um, that's right. And time, time, taking the time to, as you say, it's not four minutes. I mean, in fact, the, 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 that movement is only five. It's the, far from the longest in the 14th, but it, it, it just, you feel like the time that you spend in that music is a different kind of time to the same mm -hmm. five minutes you spend in your life. And, and what about if in this lockdown, you get three pieces of culture, any, anything, books, CDs, but only three pieces, what would you choose? What I need at the moment culturally is connection to uh, is a kind of is a kind of connection to complexity because I feel like I'm being bombarded. I'm spending my life on screens all day, and I'm being bombarded with pre-digested opinion and, like you say, sound bites and kind of memes and things that feel, you know, people streaming stuff. And I'm feeling like what I'm getting when I'm reading books uh, and listening to music is, is depth and nuance. And that's kind of why I do what I do, because I like the fact that things are, you know, like you're saying, the start of Orpheus is a man of despair amongst a pulse of music that's about life. And we need to know how do these things resolve? And then we go on a journey. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. I think that's right. It is hard to distill it down to just three pieces. In a way, that's a soundbite, I suppose. <laughs> I don't mean to like uh, mock the exercise because I, I think it's a really valid thing. What would you What would you take with you? And then, um, you know, I think in a way, I've you know, I've got a puppy at the moment, very fresh, eight week old mm -hmm. puppy, and the experience that I'm having of just being able to sit on the floor with a sort of string toy and play with that puppy and just it's kind of experience their pure unalloyed experiencedness of it which seems to me to be what culture does and of course as we get as we become professional interpreters and makers uh we get kind of very caught in in the oh is this good is this the right edition is it the right music is it right volume and tempo and all the kinds of decisions we need to make but we all, but what i'm kind of reminding myself at the moment is the experience the actual incandescent moment in the middle of that cultural experience is like the play of a puppy it's authentic it's joyous it's present whatever its emotional register is it has a kind of this this joy of doing and being and sharing and I think that's been my biggest cultural learning is like play with the puppy because it will just take you out of your kind of your comfort, your, your kind of your head zone and put you in that kind of heart in the moment zone. And that's been really useful for me. That's fantastic. I think we should all probably get a puppy after this. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts on this, Jaron. My pleasure. It's always it's always fun to come and despair with you, Dane. It's uh, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not in the rehearsal room though. No, hopefully we'll get to do it in person over a glass of wine sometime soon. To some people, the third symphony of Sibelius can be seen as a radical departure from everything that this composer had written before in the symphonic genre. Sibelius's first symphony and his second symphony were much more in this romantic, overtly emotional vein of predecessors like Tchaikovsky. And it's no wonder that this young and emerging composer was influenced by the Russian masters because Sibelius's own homeland of Finland was controlled by the Russian Empire at that time. 
And it's these landscapes, these quite empty, open, some could even argue desolate landscapes of Finland that come to mind when I think of the second movement of Sibelius' Third Symphony. It's, it's for me, endless, endless sorrow. It starts with weeping woodwinds, weeping flutes over this sort of a, a, a drone in the horns. And pizzicato strings, lower strings, there's, uh, where they pluck the strings. And it gives way to this tune of, of such unending sorrow. It's sort of like a waltz, seemingly upbeat, maybe slightly sexual European waltz, in that it lilts along in a sort of a three beat in a bar. Um, cha, cha, um, cha, cha. It's actually six beats in a bar, six four time signature and this leads to all kinds of interesting and slightly strange ambiguities because of course six can be divided into two to have to have three two lots of three that's where the waltz comes in one two three two two three but six can also be divided by three which gives you three equal groups of two Oom cha, oom cha, oom cha. One, two, three, four, five, six. Sibelius plays on this, and it's this kind of weird ambiguity, sparseness, bareness, an inner lyricism that conjures up this feeling of aloneness, of desolation, that is some kind of despair onto which is grafted this most beautiful and haunting of melodies, starting out in the woodwinds, going to the strings, having various more folk-like animated episodes in the middle, but, but always hearkening back to this darkness and this aloneness. Despair can be the absence of hope, can also be the absence of others, of love. And perhaps that's what this symphony is. Going on in Sibelius' own life at the time, 1907, when he, he finished writing this symphony, Sibelius was mired in, in a downward spiral of alcoholism. He drank a lot, so much so that his wife had to go away to a sanatorium. The same year, he was also diagnosed with throat cancer. And so it was a dark time in Sibelius' life and... This is just one of the many instances in which composers' own lives affected their music. 